two times total points at grocery stores, your same kitchen can come with more cuisines. Sapphire Preferred from Chase. Make more of what's yours. Welcome to the LA Times Talks at Sundance. I'm Yvonne Villarreal, television reporter with the LA Times. Today, we're talking about the documentary, Rita Moreno, Just a Girl Who Decided to Go For It. And joining me is Miss Rita Moreno, director and producer, Mariam perez Riera, producer, Brent Miller, producer, Ilya Velez, and composer, Catherine Bostic. Thanks so much for being here, everyone. Thank Thanks for you. Having us. So let's start with the producers, Brent and Ilya. How, how did this come about? When someone does meet someone for the first time, there's always, especially someone who is an icon like Rita, it's, you know, Rita as the icon, but then when you get to know her as a human, it was, it was interesting. It was actually surprising to me that no one had ever done a story on her or done her, her biopic. And it is such an incredible life that she has lived that I was hoping and praying that she would allow us and trust in us to, to tell her story. So I approached her early on, uh, I think it was season one of One Day at a Time, when I had first mentioned it to her. And I think it was right after we saw Norman's film, um, which uh, you know I had produced as well, Norman Lear's film called um, uh, Just Another Version of You. And Rita, you know, she enjoyed it. And I said, you know, you're next. And uh, what do you think? And and it was not a, you know, it wasn't like, you, you didn't tell me on that day. It was, it took some talking into, I mean, it was, it was, I think season two before you finally said, sure, give it a, you know, we'll give it a try. And uh, thank God I've had no reason to regret asking. My first reaction was, who, me? <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, Rita, I would have imagined you've been approached before about doing a documentary, but is that not the case? And what made you open to the idea now? Uh, Brent, ask Brent what he told me. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think this is a film that should be be taught in schools across the globe. I mean, it's 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 truly, you know, uh, something that that I think will inspire kids, both men and women, boys and girls. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's not only a, um, a story about the American dream. I mean, it's a story about feminism. It's a story about um, you know, what it takes in, in to, to try and become what you want to become. And, and it's about persistence and it's about, you know, never taking no for an answer. And, and despite all of the obstacles that are in your way, being able to push through them. And I mean, it's, it's a love story too, at the end of the day, I think a love story with, with oneself. And, you know, when you're able to be 89 years old, and reflect upon a life well lived, um, and to be able to do it so honestly, and in the way that that Rita is so vulnerable and open uh, to the camera, it's it's a gift. That made you open to the idea, Rita. Yes, absolutely, because uh, he brought in something that I, I hadn't even thought of with respect to my life. The, the truth is that when I, uh, after I saw it, I've seen it once. Uh, I literally went, wow, what a life I've had. <laughs> it kind of surprised me in a way. You know, you live your life thinking it is just your life. And then somebody comes along and says, oh, no, it's so much more than that. And it represents so much more than that. And that's when I, he really, uh, that's when I think I, he talked me into it because mostly I was concerned that, um, well, first of all, I made a promise to myself that if I was going to do a documentary of my life, I was going to be as truthful as I could be. I mean, if I've left something out now, it's only by, by accident because I, that was the intention. And what I didn't realize was that if you make a promise to, to yourself, you have to keep that promise. So that when I saw myself without makeup, I went, oh my God. God, oh! I did not have that same reaction. 
I mean, look at this and then look at me without makeup. It ain't the same person. Sorry. <laughs> I think that happens to all of us. With we should be makeup. so lucky. Anyway, the, the whole idea is that I came away hoping that people would feel the way I did when I came away from it, which is that it pays to dream and it pays to pay attention to your dreams. And uh, there is an absolute payoff to hanging on and being uh, being stubborn and just, you know, falling down and getting up. That's that's the thing, falling down, but getting up again and getting up and getting up. That never gets old, really. And in a way, I'm, if you're going to take away something from this, uh, from this, uh, documentary I think it's that Catherine you've composed for other biographical documentaries including one on August Wilson and Toni Morrison so how does your process change when you're trying to capture the sort of emotional themes of a person's life you know for me first of all it was just such an honor as I I'm still jaw dropped that I had this incredible opportunity to score this incredible narrative and um you know music is it's conversation so for me it's really being able to be engaged and be present and you get a lot of a lot of information that way and when you tune into that that degree of that kind of conversation that engaging quality of watching the narrative of literally uh imbibing with the the person in this case the wonderful rita moreno i mean this is something that you just get out of the way, frankly. And the music comes through and writes itself. And so much of this particular narrative, it resonated with me on so many levels. The, the candor, the humor, the courage. I mean, these are, these are, these are touchstones in life that, that we all can grow from and know of in our own way. So, and the fact that uh, Miriam told me how much Rita, you love jazz. Well, that made it even more, more uh, desirable because I too love jazz. I grew up listening to everything. And my mother was actually a classical, she was a classical concert pianist and composer. So I grew up in a very rich household musically. And I grew up listening to, I mean, literally everything. And so being like that kind of sponge and realizing that I had that ability to be that empathic and that I had therefore the ability to have the music as the conduit for that empathy. It's a no brainer. I just, I just told Rita when I just not meeting her, I said, you co-piloted the score with me. I, I have to do a hyphenation music by Catherine and Rita because the, that, that essence and then Miriam as a director was so patient with our process, which is very organic, which really, when you respect that kind of essence of anything, that pure, like you, you respect the unknown, you respect the fact that it's a process and it's going to be unfolding. So this was, please, I, I wish all of my collaborations could be like this. <laughs> well, Mariam, much of the terrain covered in the documentary is also covered in Rita's memoir, but how, how would you say that sort of guided you in what points you wanted to hit in the 90 minutes? Um, I read her uh, biography like three times, or I I put it on my audiobook over and over, mm -hmm. over again. Like every morning when I would wake up, that's the first thing I would start listening to, just because I wanted to also see what else I could t tell um, that was not there in the book, or how I could go even further or and deeper in conversation with her and listening to her was also a way of me realizing many things that she was talking were things that I felt myself. And so I realized that it was more of a movie, like Brent said before, it's a feminist movie. It's a movie that talks about women in general. And I really wanted to focus on that. I really wanted to have Rita be that inspiration to, to women that have gone through the same fights that she has been going through throughout her life, realizing that I'm in, in 2000, 
2019 when we were shooting this or 2018 and she had gone all of that 50 years ago i was like oh my god i feel the same that she felt so many years ago and i can't believe that's still happening to us and i felt that that was something that i really wanted to to focus on her her story i wanted to focus it from that perspective from a woman who who, who is trying to to show who she is as a woman as with her talents with her puerto rican um feelings mm -hmm. and resilience all of that so i i try to show it in, through that lens well yeah we see in the film you know the sort of uh prejudice that rita faced and also the harassment and she even opens up about you know being raped by her agent and we see all that and then we sort of flash forward to the present and we're seeing rita watch you know the kavanaugh hearings um was that sort of expected did you know it was going to align like that or um no that wasn't i mean in the editing room yes but that happened that we were lucky enough those things that happen when you're shooting and especially when you're shooting a documentary you 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 have a um, you know what you want to shoot but then you get all these gifts that happen and that was one of them and the day that we were shooting her on the set of one day at a time was the day that w that the Kavanaugh um was happening so and she loves to watch the news so as soon as she turned on that the news um we had to shoot that and it and it it, it works so great with the film and with that point that i that i brought up which is this is so, something that keeps happening today how come well i was gonna say that mariam um had very clear from the beginning that she wanted this to be a, a story about you but to be to be also a story about activism and feminism and and all of those spaces that you went through that were parallel to your story and that would not her telling your story on the contrary it would enhance but it's not a typical story it's not a typical biopic it's a biopic that's also revolutionary in some way and it's um it's it, it speaks i was going to add to what brent said um that it speaks a lot about resilience and hope too and representation i think those three other um art topics that are really really part of this project but yeah we discussed that very much mariem Mariam sat down and 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 we, you know, it was really and and with Brent and Michael and and the team, it was a it was a team conversation, um, you know, getting to the to the story. It was, by the way, Mariam's brilliant idea to do the the paper dolls, which just knocks me out because I used to play with those by the way a lot. That's one of those th things that you start creating and writing and it came to my mind i love paper dolls myself and i used to play with them when i was little too and just again reading her book i realized that she had to be someone that she didn't want to be she was many times um i got inspired by her telling her mom used to um make her her dresses so i put those things together her mom putting her dresses and, and, and making her um, dress up in all these different um, costumes because since she was a little girl, she's been performing. So that was my first image. But then I realized also that those costumes were also all the different um, personalities that she's playing, that it's not her. And to see her now being herself after so many years of her playing someone that she was not, I think it was important. And I have to mention that the person who did the animation, the stop animation, is a very talented Puerto Rican friend. And I'm really happy that we were able to collaborate with him, with Kike Rivera. 
So it's uh, behind the camera, there's a lot of Puerto Ricans involved as well. One of the things that really struck me was how vivid your memory is, Rita, because like I can't remember last week and you're recalling in such great detail some of you know the events of your life. I can't imagine what it's like to be friends with you because I would just want to hear stories all the time. Brent, as someone that has known Rita for a while, is that something that is one of the great sort of things about knowing Rita? Like, are you constantly hearing stories? Are you asking her stories? Is he ever? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as Rita says in the movie, forever the actress, forever the actress. <laughs> you know, I think that I've always been drawn to people who are older than me because they've lived longer than me and I can learn from them. And I think any conversation you have with someone like Rita is what you can walk away with and what you can learn. And for me, um, and for I think anyone who's gonna watch this film, it's, it's again, I, 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 not to repeat myself, but, but this film is not just about, about Rita's life, it's an example of a life well lived. And I think that there's a lot to learn from it um on so many levels so yes of course any opportunity i i have to hear stories from rita uh we 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 share that that's i mean whether it's a text message or it's a late night phone call um you know there's 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 no uh holding back on both both ends by the way because you know one one of the things that i i also love about rita and you you may not know is that she's also a very curious person in other people she wants to know and she's a great listener and she you know, that's probably my guess is is also what keeps her so youthful is that curiosity, that five year old Rosita. You know, it's it's you know, it's something that I think Norman Lear shares as well. You know, that he, too, is curious about other people. And uh, and I think there's a secret there. At, having mentioned that uh, one of the things and I think Catherine will appreciate this a lot. One of the things. I think I'm a very smart person. Uh, I don't think I'm brilliant, but I'm a very smart, instinctive person. And I come by that not so much naturally as from experience. It's from having had to deal with uh, racism. It has, and this happens a lot with black people. You have more than three or four antennae coming from you because you, you've gotten used to being, trying to be prepared for, for whatever negative things may happen. And that gives me a certain kind of what I call street smarts. So it's not that I'm brilliant. I hardly think I'm that, and I would never dream of saying that, but I am very, very smart. And in fact, Tony Kushner, who wrote uh, the new version of West Side Story, and for your information, he wrote um, Angels in America. Um, he said that about me once. He says, boy, you are so smart. And I said, well, what makes you think? And then he told me things that he noticed, but they're very small things. But um, don't try to bullshit me. <laughs> <laughs> well, to that point, Reed, I mean, you in the film, you talk about those early years of trying to find your place in Hollywood, and you speak very candidly about the pain of being typecast in Hollywood. And then, you know, West Side Story happens, you win an Oscar, but it didn't suddenly make you in demand. Um, so did there come a point where you became aware of how history making your career would be for those who came after you? No, and I wasn't because I didn't think of myself in that way. That, that, that's iconic thinking. And uh, that's certainly something I was, you know, as far as I was concerned, I had won that Oscar. And it was just uh, Rita Moreno had won that. I didn't know at the time, really, that I was representing with that, whether, whether I knew it or not. And I'll tell you why I didn't know, because that surprises a lot of people. When I was doing movies prior to West Side Story as well, I never got much fan mail. And I often wondered why. I thought, does everybody hate me? That can't be. And I realized 
only during West Side Story and my success in that, that Puerto Rican people specifically, but a lot of Hispanic people didn't do fan mail then. You know, now we have such a different kind of media where everybody's communicating. But so I, I never really was in touch very much with my own community. I did do things that were political for a number of political organizations that were Hispanic, but it never occurred to me that I had a real public for me, for Rita Moreno, the actress. And it wasn't until this next story I'm gonna tell you that, that I realized that I meant a great deal to my community. A friend told me a story when she lived in, during the Oscar time. During the Oscar time, the, all the windows were open that night. It was a very hot night. And you could hear the Oscars playing everywhere in the El Barrio. And normally, El Barrio is a very noisy place because we tend to be kind of raucous and laugh loud and we cry loud. We, we're, we're just very, let me say this, we're very present. <laughs> She told me that, as usual, they were gabbing away, but all the windows were open. And then when Rock Hudson, who was a big star then, came to announce the names of the um, nominees, she said the place became absolutely dead, dead, dead quiet. And he said, and the nominees are, and he mentioned, of course, everybody in that neighborhood knew who I was. And when he called my, and the winner is, when he called my name, he said the place went up in smoke. They were screaming and running up to the window and she did it. Se la comió, wow, she did it. And you know, a friend of mine said to me, you know what they were really saying was we did it. That really of course. Me, that, that made me cry. But then I realized that Puerto Rico went up in smoke too, that the island, up just on its own from that particular moment in, in, in Oscar history for us. So, uh, but it's, it's why I didn't have a big connection till then with my own people because nobody wrote fan letters or very few did. And it was just not the custom. It just wasn't something we did. And uh, we, we have the media now, which is insane, but we didn't then, so I didn't know. But I, what I didn't know was that I had a lot, I had a lot of family, a lot of family. That was thrilling to me. Isn't that a good story? It's beautiful. Ilya, like, what, what did you find most surprising in the process of making this film? I think finding that that and and maybe she said it and now she's gonna think that I that I'm saying it because she said it but that Rita is really intelligent and and I'm not gonna say smart I'm going to say intelligent but she also has a very good smell for for BS and she reads people and you can really earn her trust and her love but you really have to earn it and. And for me, I think one of the tasks I thought I had um, when, you know, like producing, like line producing right there, since we were gonna be uh, filming in, uh, at her house was to, to be as invisible as, as, as possible, but also to make her feel as comfortable as possible. And um, to, because Mariem, one of the, of, of Mariem's main purposes was to get um, as much honesty from Rita as possible. So for me, it was surprising that that she she was very very intuit, in, intuitive too. You know, she's very much uh, that kind of person. So you know, the rest we kind of knew in terms of Rita, um, but but that part of her personality and how human and how. Um, um, uh, empathica, how do you say that? How much empathy she can have? That was a, a, like a very, very good um, uh, surprise that I had, that I got. Catherine, I'm, I'm curious, like one of the great parts about this is 
seeing some of the footage from the early work and, you know, seeing some of the home videos and stuff like that. How much did the archival footage inspire you? Well, all of it inspired me, actually. And to, to go back to Ilya's point about empath, because, Rita, you are so authentic. I mean, you, you, there's no room for anything else in your self-awareness. And because you just are so comfortable in how you sit in that, in that throne, that watching the archival footage, watching your just Q and A's and just your riffs and your whatever, whatever it was that involved your, your narrative, um, it, it just informed me. And that in terms of the archival, you know, I was given really great direction by Miriam for um, some of the childhood moments. We had different themes um, that Miriam began to define in terms of the emotional context that, that you wanted, right, Miriam? You know, you had, uh, she had, one was Dusty, what was it, Dusty Maiden um, theme? Maiden. And then yeah. another. Dusky. Yeah. Dusky. Dusky, sorry, Dusky, sorry. That, the fact that you had to darken yourself to become this caricature of what a less than, a minority, a, 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 a Latina, the, anything non-white, we're gonna just make you brown, period, in a discussion. And so that just spoke volumes to me as a human being. And I still have conversations with people that we still def we self-define by color. I mean, the fact that we even call ourselves people of color. I have huge issues oh with that because, because everyone has a color, number one, and it distracts from the real truth, which is character. So when I tune in back to you, back to you, Rita, I just tuning in, it just, I'm telling you, this music wrote itself and I just cannot thank you all enough for bringing me, because I was a little, I was very busy at the time and I, and I didn't know, I kept kind of not waffling, but I kept, I just was like, you know, I was in Catherine land, whatever, whatever that is. <laughs> and you guys were so tenacious because you knew maybe on, a, on another level and maybe Rita, your presence and your spirit, you, that you said, no, Catherine has to do this. And now I'm about to be in tears because it touched me on so many levels. So the music, I'm telling you, it was a gift. And that's all I can say. I remember having many conversations with Catherine about the music. We spoke a lot on the phone just to, to try to describe what we wanted to, to do. And it was very interesting because I kept telling Catherine, I don't know how to exp explain it. And she's like, you are, just keep talking. And it was a great, um, a great collaboration because it was, um, I didn't have to talk about music but about feelings and like she said i had different um themes in terms of rita when she was a little girl and rita when she was down or rita when she was celebratory and and that's how I, that was catherine trying to interview me in order to get whatever she needed to make the music there's a moving and heartbreaking moment when you're talking about the passing of your husband, Lenny, and you speak so honestly about how you let a bit of yourself dim in that dynamic. And you get emotional talking about it. You had to take a break. But I think so many women can understand what you meant to that. It doesn't mean that you didn't love him or that you regret that relationship, but recognizing that you lost yourself a little bit with that. How was it to be that honest about something like that? I'm so glad you brought that up because that, that was really hard. And uh, I could have just as easily probably not talked about it or just simply said, you know, it was a troubled marriage. But I felt obliged because I did make a promise to myself that I would be as truthful as I could possibly be. And I also felt a responsibility to other women who have lived this kind of experience. And I have a feeling there's tons and tons of women. You know, 
I asked uh, some women who were widowed how they felt after their husband had, husbands had passed away. And out of four of them, two of them said, they just said it out loud, something I had not the courage to do. They said, I was so relieved. And I said, really? And you don't mind saying that? She says, well, that doesn't mean I didn't love him. It simply means that I felt an enormous pressure lifted from my life and from my shoulders. And I remembered that when I was talking to uh, Maryam about this, and I thought, well, I'll just call this a community service. And uh, I, I need to talk about things like that that are important to other people as well, and let them know that it's not as unusual as you think it might be. Because the first thing you say to yourself when, you're, when you feel that first relief is, my God, what kind of piece of work are you? What's wrong with you? How could you feel that way? 46 years, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I was just so busy uh, telling myself terrible things about me. And then, you know, little by little, I, I came to understand that uh, that was our marriage. It was, it was uh, failed in some ways and immensely successful in others. He was probably the loveliest man I've ever known. So, you know, there are other things. But you, uh, you have to keep your promises even when it's free to your own self. I want to add to that. Um, that's why I say this movie is about, it's to inspire women because it inspired me. I, I was actually, when, right before we started shooting this film, I was going through a divorce myself. So, when Rita was saying that, it, it was like me wanting to say that too. So I couldn't believe, again, me so many years after experiencing the same thing that she experienced. Um, so I know there's a lot of women that feel the same. And I, it was that too. I want this movie to inspire other women. What's interesting too is that the time in which this documentary is coming out is so relevant so relevant. Uh, I mean, it's just astonishing. It's as though we planned this because uh, I think I've become the representative of not just Hispanic women, but women. I was going to add that, that the same as in, in films, in, in feature films, a good acting transcends the lens. The same goes for an honest um, interview and an honest answer in a documentary. And I think that's what gets to people. I think the thing that, that makes this project, um, you know, the best in, you know, the, the, the best asset of the project is that honesty and seeing Rita in her everyday life, you know, she was truly honest and that really transcended the lens and, and, you, and you get it. Well, Rita, before yeah. we wrap, I mean, there's still so much left in your story and your 90th birthday is coming up. Are you, what are you thinking about for the 90th? I know it's hard to even think in terms of a birthday bash at this point in the pandemic, but how, like, what are, what are your hopes for 90? I'm going to be 90 on December 11th. On December 10th, if uh, everything goes well, West Side Story opens. And wow. uh, you know I'm in this. So I said to Stephen, I said, man, I'm going to be 90. He said, not quite then. I said, I said yes, I am. I'm going to be 90. You better open this damn movie. But you know, it's been hard because of the pandemic. We can't wait for that. And I hope we get to it safely and soon because I think it would uplift all our spirits. I just want to thank you so much for taking the time. It was such a pleasure speaking with all of you. I, it was, it was it's always a pleasure. Thank you. It was marvelous. Thank you so much. Hey.